Welcome to another Family Bible Study. Again, together we're going to look into the Word of God to discover what God has to teach us. My, my, isn't it wonderful that we have a book called the Bible that is right from the mouth of God so that everything we're reading we know is super important, super trustworthy, uh, and something that has been directed was written originally right to us because we are part of the human race and we know that we better listen carefully. Now, we have been spending a lot of time in these recent months in the book of Jeremiah, and it is not a happy study. We would have to be out of our minds to think that this is a happy study. But the fact is, it's very real. It's very true. It's what God wants us to know about it. Everything in the Bible is, is, is there for our enlightenment and for our encouragement, even though it may sound like it isn't at times, it, it, because we are so devastated by what we read in it. And yet, ultimately, it is for our encouragement, because as we look at the, the gospel scene, the religious scene of the world today and we wonder where is truth what's going on what's happening what's happening to our churches what's happening in uh, in uh, all over the world we're so delighted that we can go to the bible and there we can find truth there we can get an objective analysis an objective perspective of what really is going on we uh, there's no way we can get that from any source except the Bible. Now we've been in Jeremiah chapter nine for some for a few studies, and it opened up with a uh, uh, kind of set the tone for the chapter. Oh, that my head there were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. It is a chapter of woe, a chapter of pain, of sorrow, because of the terrible thing that is happening. Oh, yes, the example was ancient Judah and ancient Israel as God was bringing his judgments upon them. But in actuality, it was pointing right to our situation today as God is dealing with the local congregations and is finished with them. And, and they are under the judgment of God. And uh, as we read this, we under, can begin to understand how terrible, terrible, terrible all of this is. It's the kind of thing that should be bringing weeping and wailing. Well, we finally got down to, to uh, 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 verse 12. And the question is raised. This is Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 12. And the question is raised, Who is the wise man that may understand this? Uh, this we covered this in our last study, but I just want to uh, tie back into that as we go on with uh, this chapter. Who is the wise man that we may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken, that he may declare it? For what the land, for that, for what the land perisheth and is burned up like a wilderness, and that, that none passeth through. Remember, we saw that phrase, "none passeth through." That is the land, and the land is not the land of Canaan, uh, the physically, literally over there. Ultimately, it is the land that is the external representation of the kingdom of God. Yes. In the day that Jeremiah was writing, the land of Canaan was the external rep representation of the kingdom of God. But now that land, that external representation of the kingdom of God for over 1900 years has been the local congregations. And now no one can pass through it. That is, the purpose of the churches and congregations was that people might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might come under the hearing of the word, the word might be applied to their life, and so they would find the door, the Lord Jesus Christ, there through which they could pass, uh, and, uh, and uh, God would bring them through this into eternal life, into the more abundant life of being forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, now that door has been shut. 
Uh, there is none that can pass through. It is a, uh, it is a, a place. It's a trap. It's a snare. Anyone who remains there will remain there. Uh, they will not find eternal life while they're in those congregations. And now in verse 13, we're going to go on uh, with our study today with verse 13. The Lord said, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even as people with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink, I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. Language could not be any more plain than this. This is setting forth in very precise language that can easily be understood as to why God's judgment has come on the local congregations or on anyone, anyone at any time in history, on Judah of old or Israel of old that perished in 709 B.C. Judah came to its end in 587 B.C. And, uh, and finally, uh, the nation of Israel was no longer used of God after, after Christ went back to heaven in 33 A.D., and now the local congregations that have been uh, the apple of God's eye, the, the institution, the divine institution that God had been using for throughout the New Testament era uh, to bring the gospel to the world now are also under the same judgment. Why? Why? And here God says, because they have forsaken my law. God has created man in his image in his likeness, and uh, therefore mankind is accountable to God to obey God's laws. And God's laws are carefully set forth in the Bible, although they already operate within the heart of man, even apart from the Bible. The law is written on man's heart, and uh, whether it is man without the Bible and uh, disobeying the law that God has written on man's heart, the we know this from Romans chapter 2. That uh, uh, Well, let's look at that a second again just to make sure that we're not misquoting. We read in Romans chapter 2 where God says in verse 14, For when the Gentiles, that is the nations, and it's talking in this context about those who've never heard the Bible, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, that is the written word, the Bible, but do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not a law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. They show the work of the law written on their hearts. The very fact that man was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, he has a sensitivity in his heart that there is a God that whom he must obey intuitively. He knows it's wrong to murder, to steal, to commit adultery, to do a lot of the other hideous things that do happen as mankind uh, freely sins uh, to the degree that they do sin. Well, here is the problem. Therefore, God's wrath comes. Now, this is particularly terrible for the local congregations. Because they not only have God's law written on their heart, these people, but we who are part of the, have been a part of the local congregations as well as, there were, who, as those who are still there, have the written word of God. We've got the whole law of God. We've got everything that God has to say concerning how we are to live. So there is no excuse, none whatsoever. And God did not give the Bible to the churches in some kind of a hidden way. It was not like uh, yeah, uh, every congregation has a particularly holy room that nobody gets into except maybe the pastor once a year, like the 
priest going into the day of into the holy of holies on the day of atonement, and he would quickly glance at the Bible and come out and and uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe have something uh, for this year to tell the congregation. No, 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 no. The Bible has not been a hidden book. It's been out there. It's been for everybody to listen to, and in particularly in our day. In the last few hundred years since the time of the printing press and Bibles have been printed and, and uh, made more and more available, there's less and less reason why, uh, why someone cannot know the whole law of God. But here comes the, the indictment. Uh, they have forsaken the law and have not obeyed my voice. Uh, God is, is emphasizing, look, this law is not just a piece of paper. This is not a cure, just a curious book. This is not just kind of a, a book that you put on a pedestal and say, Oh, that's the holy word of God. Isn't that nice? Isn't that wonderful? And we walk and tiptoes around it. No way. The Bible is God's word to be read carefully, carefully, and to be assimilated into our conscience and to be... Uh, to be uh, something that we're to pray for understanding so that we can begin to obey it. I have set this law before them. And uh, my, my, and uh, here come, here is the indictment. They've forsaken my law. And, of course, a lot of good people in the congregations of our day will say, no, 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 that's not true. That's not true. That's true of the other churches, but not of our church. That's true of the other families, but not of our families. You know, we, we read the Bible every day, and, uh, and we uh, worship every Sunday. We carry our Bible with us. And, and in fact, I, uh, we can uh, quote quite a number of verses of the Bible. We can, we can uh, quote John 3.16 and... And, and a lot of other verses of the Bible. Really, the Bible is part of our life. Really? Really? How much of the Bible is part of our life? That is the problem, you see. The Bible is a very, very big book, and it's got a whole lot of information in it. And it's written in a way that it can be very easily misunderstood. What did Jesus say? He spoke in parables so that they would not understand. And so there are great portions of the Bible, just like the book of Jeremiah that we're reading, that effectively is really a historical parable. And it's a closed book to most theologians today because they don't understand that the Bible was written in this fashion. And so while they claim they are following the Bible, and indeed, there are many verses, particularly those that deal with morality. Well, some morality. My, my, today, when we look at what has happened to the laws concerning marriage and divorce and adultery and fornication and birth control, and uh, which are all moral laws, and yet they're, they're, they're uh, openly uh, uh, disobeyed. Uh, w without any embarrassment or shame of any kind. They're, they're disobeyed by those in the local congregations. Oh, yes, yes. We still, uh, you can still hear good sermons on being nice to your neighbor and forgiving and, and, uh, and a lot of other morality, but that is finally also not the essence of the Word of God. The essence of the Word of God is... The gospel of salvation. How do we? How can we know our sins? And how? Uh, how can we know how God saves us? And and uh, and what uh, what do we have to do or can't do in order to become saved? And so on. And those passages are not even understood, and they're hardly ever taught with any with any truth of any kind because the Bible is not listened to. We have forsaken the Word of God. I, get, I, I, I still remember years and years ago, maybe this was as long as 35 years ago, I've always had a great interest in the Word of God. And I was on a mission committee with some young pastors, and, and uh, 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 
one of them came to me and he said, you know, you keep talking about the Bible. It's like you make an idol of the Bible. And I looked at him in astonishment and I said, but the Bible, the Bible, that's the word of God. That comes from the mouth of God. How can we uh, idealize it too much? How can we have too much respect for it? But he didn't understand uh, because too many are taught, you know, well, the Bible has errors in it and and it's subject to the women uh, caprices of the translators and and uh, they, they're not always certain whether they have the best original documents to translate from. And there's all kinds of arguments as to that really cut down the authority of the Bible when they don't hold true. If we really investigate them out, all of these criticisms, criticisms don't hold true. It's simply that mankind does not want to have an absolute authority. That's the nature of man. I want to be my own boss. I want to be my own authority. I want to do what I want. I will go along with the Bible as long as it pleases me, as long as I'm happy with it. But if, if you begin to get into areas that uh, like t- telling me that I can't do anything at all about getting saved. It has to depend 100% on God. I don't want to buy that. I don't accept that. It doesn't uh, fit my idea of what a fair God would be or a righteous God that he would, a fact that he would elect some people to salvation and let the others go by and go on their way to hell. I can't buy that. I, and so mankind wants to uh, redesign the Bible in their own thinking. And this is exactly the way it walks. In in any case, they have walked, verse 14, they have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart. They, this is, this is an indictment that if we look at what is happening in the theological world today, the gospel world, we're not talking about the Mohammedans and the Buddhists and the Confucianists and the Taoists and the, and the way out religions that have nothing to do with the Bible of any kind. We know they're all dead in the water. We know they're all false. They're totally out of the mind of men. We're talking about the, the gospel where, where uh, the Bible has been central in the local congregations. And yet, as we look at them, we see, as we look at them candidly and objectively, we see that they've missed the mark a million miles. These indictments uh, uh, can be understood. We can see why God's judgment is on them. And and, uh, notice in verse 14, uh, they have walked after the um, they have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Now, Balaam that's a plural word for Baal. Baal means lord or a false lord. Baalim would mean false lords, plural. In other words, a great many different false gods. Now, anyone uh, could read this right now and say, you know, you're going down the wrong path altogether. Tell me, you show me one church that's, that worships Baal, that worships Baal. Well, we have to define Baal. You know, it is, it is true that back in the Old Testament days, there, was a, uh, there were some of the false gods that were called Baal. Others were called Ashtoreth. Other were, others were called a star, and, and there, was, there were other, other uh, names that were given to them. But actually, any time we say, thus saith the Lord, and, and claim that what we are saying is from the mouth of God, and it is not from God, effectively, we are worshiping another kind of a God. We are saying that this is true when it is not true. We are claiming that it is from God when it is not from God. Now, if it is, if it is uh, not from God of the Bible, 
And we are claiming that it is a divine statement that this is what the Bible teaches. Uh, It has come from another source, right out of our own sin-infected mind is normally where it comes from. And so we have set up our own God we, because a God is someone whom we worship, whom we obey, whom we uh, respect and honor. And when we, uh, when we come up with a doctrine that is contrary to the Word of God, it is we're not honoring the God of the Bible. It's a big fat lie insofar as the God of the Bible. And so we are honoring a false God. We are worshiping Balaam, Balaam. And, uh, and uh, that is why if we are a true believer, we have an intense desire in our heart to check out, check out, double check, triple check, burn the midnight oil, compare Scripture with Scripture to be sure that we are as faithful as possible to the Word of God. We know that we have feet of clay. We know that we don't just come to truth immediately, perfectly, uh, all the way down the line, but we know also that uh, that we're ready to make a correction and we want to search out and keep searching out, checking and cross-checking to make sure we do have the truth. That is the nature of someone who is truly a child of God. But when we come to a point where we have accepted certain doctrines and we're, we've been... Uh, you notice it says here, it says here, which their fathers taught them. Now, that's a very interesting statement, which their fathers taught them. If you look at modern theology today, where does it come from? Well, this is is what our church has believed for hundreds of years. This is what the Reformers taught. This is what the the, uh, great men, the great theologians of old have taught. Now, some of these theologians surely were children of God. They loved the Lord. But on the other hand, they didn't have their spiritual eyes open to the same degree that we can have them open today. And yet, uh, and so they have taught some things that were not as accurate as they should be in the, uh, insofar as the Word of God is concerned. And yet today there are those who slavishly hold on to that. The fathers taught this. It has been good enough for the church for the last 200 years. It's certainly good enough for me. And they fail to realize that the Bible is a living organism, and we are to constantly search it and learn and, uh, and grow in grace, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and the knowledge of what this salvation really is.